Morning. Today we have the pleasure of hosting Drs. Ashisha Trija, Pani Purumal Swami, and Jeffrey Weiss for a talk on digital medicine technologies. Dr. Atreja has received formal training in public health and is board certified in gastroenterology, clinical informatics, and internal medicine. Over the last 10 years, he has led many public health and informatics initiatives at the Cleveland Clinic and Mount Sinai Medical Center. As Chief Technology Innovation and Engagement Officer, he leads the Sinai App Lab that is a one-of-a-kind collaborative hub to build and test digital medicine technologies. Dr. Atreja has published more than 50 papers and has presented nationwide on topics related to digital medicine and patient engagement. Dr. Purumal Swami is an Assistant Professor of Medicine at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. She is a transplant hepatologist, gastroenterologist, and health services researcher who has dedicated her research to early detection and linked to care for persons who are at risk of viral hepatitis. She is director of the Hepatitis Outreach Program, Network, excuse me, a viral hepatitis outreach program that partners with public health and community partners in New York City. Dr. Weiss is a clinical psychologist providing care to persons with infectious diseases and conducts research on how behavioral interventions can improve quality and length of life. He is an Associate Professor of Medicine at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai and the Director of the Hepatitis C Clinical and Research Program in the Division of General Internal Medicine. He is also a Principal Investigator of two NIH-funded studies. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Atreja, Purumal Swami, and Weiss. Thank you, Asmin. Happy New Year to all. Um, and I think uh, New Year is a time for reflection to say, look back at the last year to say what has been working, especially in digital medicine space, and what we can do at Sinai to leverage this tremendous innovation that's happening in this space and plan for 2016. Um, and it is by design we have three speakers today. And the reason for that is really to give the impression that a lot of the stuff we are doing in apps, analytics, digital medicine space is very collaborative. Um, and there's no one who has the knowledge or the science because it's rapidly evolving. Uh, but together we can work and do things which we've never been able to do before. So these are a few of my disclosures. Um, as my mentors will tell me, Ashish, you have a long way to go because you only have four disclosures to make. You really need to do more and more collaboration with industry and with outside. So you ha have to have a scrolling list of your disclosures. So for the first 30 minutes, uh, I'll mainly talk about the developments that have happened, especially in the last year in the field of digital medicine. Um, and the last 20 minutes we'll spend of a real world example of how we researchers in medicine got together with Sana App Lab and created a unique custom solution for patients with hepatitis C. And the goal is to empower each one of us to start thinking about our speciality and see how we can work together to create a new paradigm in technologies that's shaping up. Um, and in a way, this reflects my journey. Um, and on a personal note, a lot of what has happened in my career is because of, not because of me, is because of the technology advances that have happened. I just happened to be in that time zone. Uh, so in 99, when I was doing my medical school, that was the time when the internet was becoming mainstream. It was still a dial-up modem, but that allowed me, when I was in India, to send emails to at least 100, 200 potential advisors uh, for my master's in public health. And if there was no email at that time, I would not be in front of you speaking and talking today, right? So at the same time when the email was happening, a lot of the literature was going away from journals, written journals, to actually PubMed, which became online. And a lot of the literature review became so much easy for all of us because we could suddenly scan everything that was published in a moment of time, all electronically. When I did my residence in Cleveland Clinic, that was the time we call it the dreaded EHR era. Electronic health records were coming, and we had a chance, starting from 2001 to 2004, to really learn what it can do for us and what it cannot do for us. Um, and a lot of my research, a lot of the quality care initiatives that I have done, a lot of the grants have been based on the work of EHRs. And I'm very lucky for the last three years since I've been at Sinai, uh, we got an opportunity to set up Sina App Lab to really leverage the innovations that's happening in the digital medicine space. And what is really empowering our digital medicine that is different than internet and the EHRs is the fact for the first time I feel 
we as physicians have power to design and develop solutions for our patients. In electronic health records, we were captive to other vendors, to the epics of the world, and we have to live what someone else designed for us. And those were no way perfect solutions. Um, but now we cannot say these are not perfect solutions because we actually have a full control over what we design. So it's very empowering to be in digital medicine. The other thing which is very interesting that has happened, again, an outside uh, influence, is the, all the initiatives are aligning together for value-based healthcare, which means there's actually money on the table to bring better healthcare to our population. So in a very historic announcement last year, it's been 12 months now, HHS announced its full commitment to have up to 50% of physician reimbursement through value-based care by 2018. And that is huge if you see. That means 50% of my salary is at risk if we don't really take good control of our population, right? And that holds true for all of us in US. Um, the challenge is none of the health systems in US today are really ready for all this value-based care. It's coming faster than we could imagine. And as an example, 76% of hospitals in 2015 left half a billion dollar on the table because they could not meet the readmission criteria set off by the CMS. And things are gonna get worse as the mandatory bundle payments are gonna come for joint replacement as well. So we really need to have some other technology help us which is scalable and brings efficiency into this entire healthcare delivery. And that's where we're looking digital medicine for. US has always been kind of the hub for innovation. And even though the cost for creating therapeutics has been increasing, uh, it takes on an average of two to $2.5 billion to actually get a drug into the market. But still there's so many drugs coming down the pipeline. And this is an example for the medicines that are coming for ulcerative colitis, which happens to be my area of interest. The challenge is not innovation and what's, what we can get. The challenge is how do we take the innovation that's happening outside and bring into our health system? That's where we call it rubber meets the road. And this is where the challenge, the value-based care also is trying to address. So for example, there are not many IBD centers in US today which can tell how many patients in their practice are getting the best practices what we normally recommend. And this is true for diabetics, this is true for heart failure, this is true for rheumatoid arthritis as well. Even if we end up giving the right medication at the right time to majority of our patients, we do not know how many of our patients are really adherent to the medication or the recommendation we gave them. And even if we do that, we have no way of knowing how many of our patients have uncontrolled symptoms at any given time, right? As physicians, we see the patients at a once very small point of time. This is 0.1% of their entire lifetime, right? 99.9% .9 the time the patients spend is either at their home or their workplace. And till date, we have absolutely zero idea what is happening to them at their home, whether that is high blood pressure control, uh, CHF heart failure symptoms, asthmatic flares, we have absolutely no idea. So the high quality care we are actually able to give to these patients is only to a small segment of population. And that's what is very classic tip of the iceberg care we are able to give. There are patients who are actually in good control. We are able to give the best practice recommendations to them and they are also have a very good quality of life and we pat ourselves in the back to say a job well done. But there are many more patients who may not be doing that good, who may have some symptoms either of depression or for other symptoms of our disease, but we never have an opportunity to talk about them in a brief 15 minutes visit. And these are the patients whom we think are in control, but they are not in control. Whether they are poorly, poorly controlled asthmatics or patients with heart failure or with IBD. And then there are patients who are lost to the system. They have seen us once or twice, but because we do not have a regular tracking capability, they're lost to the system. They may be getting surgery somewhere else across the, the island, but we have no idea. And then there are patients who are still waiting to be correctly diagnosed or correctly access the right physician, which is required for their disease. As we go to value-based healthcare, we will not be paid for the tip of the iceberg patients for fee-for-service. We will actually be accountable for all these entire population of patients. 
And many of these populations, we have absolutely no idea what is happening to them. On top of that, for every single patient we see, we're being asked to do more and more, right? It's coming to a point that we just are running the checklist uh, in the electronic health record for majority of our chronic disease patients. And these shows the 12 indicators uh, from American Gastroenterology Association for IBD. It's not virtually possible or it's operationally too burdensome to actually document all of these by physicians in every single visit. If we really don't change the way we practice medicine, we're going to land up with something like this, right? So we really need tools. Tools empower us. So how do we get those tools which really can create efficiency in this entire ecosystem and help us get to a new level of care, a population-based care? So welcome to the new age of digital medicine. If you really look at a snapshot of what digital medicine is, it's where technology meets medicine. And it's not just limited to apps, analytics, variables, telemedicine. But the technology is coming every day, a new kind of technologies. So we take a wholesome approach of this digital medicine landscape. And if you look at what's really happening in 2015, this is a very good snapshot of the number of apps in the market today and their categories. There are more than 165,000 apps in the healthcare space uh, in 2015. Now, if, we, if I see the last two weeks, we already have probably crossed 10,000 more apps during the holidays. Uh, but if you really look, bulk of the apps are just patient-facing. What we call is consumer-facing. Uh, if you take fitness apps, wellness apps, medical reference engines, some, so they account for at least 70, 80 percent of the apps which are there in the market today. The apps which really we feel there should be and we should put our energy on are the apps which connect the patients with the physicians. We call it deeply integrated apps. And those are less than 6.6% of the apps. However, if we look at in the next five years, and we look at which of the apps or technologies are going to really create a maximum value proposition for us, on the top of the list are the deeply integrated apps which connects consumers with the physicians or population health people. These are the apps which will allow remote monitoring, remote consultation through telemedicine, diagnostic reminders and alerts, right? So, there's a, so we can get fooled by the number of the apps, all the consumer-facing apps, but really we have to see which apps we are ready to bring into our ecosystem and which we can create maximum value for our healthcare system. And those are different kind of apps. Now, there's a lot of convergence happening. And in fact, we don't see telemedicine as a separate technology than digital medicine. We think there's a convergence between telemedicine and apps. And a lot of the apps actually have telemedicine module built into them. A lot of telemedicine apps have remote monitoring capability built into them. Um, last year was the first year when more than 50% of the states actually have telemedicine parity law passed. That means telemedicine for the first time in US is reimbursable in majority of the states. The technology has been there for the last 20 years. In fact, I practiced telemedicine in 2004 in Cleveland Clinic, but that was not reimbursed. That was part of the employee wellness population. Now you will have tools to telemedicine, and you can use for your patients. And some of that, if the right insurer payer comes, you will be reimbursed for that. And this holds true for New York State, because the New York State law passed last year, and it is uh, getting into effect this month itself. So with all these technology in the background, um, we had a mission for Sana App Lab we started three years ago. The mission was apps plus analytics equals awesome outcomes. And it has been a fascinating journey over the la last three years. The goal was to bring an innovation team in-house within Sanai, right? Instead of us being hostage to third-party vendors, to third-party vendors who have designed electronic health records, we want to have our own internal team which can work and collaborate with our researchers, our clinicians, our scientists, and create tools for our population. And it is irrespective of the technology or the tool that we have to bring in, whether that is Android apps, iOS apps, web apps, whether that is analytics, variable devices, or whether that is running clinical trials to prove the apps really work or not. We wanted to have this entire ecosystem within Mount Sinai. We started off with first app, which was Health Promise, it was funded by NIH. Um, and the goal was to create a unified report card which combines patient symptoms and quality of life 
with what we spend majority of the time, checklist of care and quality of care metrics, and what a lot of the insurer and the payers and the value-based people need is hospital and ER visits. Now, all this data does not reside in vacuum. This HIPAA compliant platform brings all this data, which is predominantly entered by patients, into a dashboard which physicians can access or physician surrogates like population health coordinator can access. And we are realizing through this journey that there's a very important new workforce that we have to create, which can actually serve as an interface between the physicians and the patients. And our name for that is population health coordinator, but people are also calling it by navigators. Uh, and the goal is all this data that is now available to us can come back and someone can filter the data and notify the physicians at the right time for the right patient. So if you can look at this screenshot, uh, all the major dimensions of the quality of life are coming through for the patient, captured every two weeks, along with the checklist of care. So we have a real-time dashboard of all our patients, right? So this is right now in a clinical trial, and we're measuring the effectiveness of it. But let's fast forward two years later on. Suppose we have a tool like this for our entire diabetic population or heart failure population or rheumatoid arthritis population. Suddenly we have a way to connect personal health with population health. For the first time, we'll be able to measure, we'll have a complete measurement tool for our entire population, how they are doing at any given week. So we can actually proactively reach out to them when they need us, rather than reactively them reaching out to us twice a year. So even before we have to complete our trial, we're just completing the recruitment for Health Promise. We've already started getting a lot of interest and we have built a network for common academic practices to implement Health Promise. And the network has actually included now sites from Canada and also China. So just to show that things are moving much more faster and the traditional way of how we used to do research, we used to build on linearly aspect one time at a time. People are actually demanding many times these technology even before we have a time or we have a chance to actually improve outcomes per se. So we have to engage, some, sometimes we have to engage and get maximum population and we can learn together in a much more pragmatic manner. Um, and we are also thinking of how we can bring convert randomized control trial to more pragmatic control trials or adaptive trials so we can learn fast and implement fast in this ecosystem. And talking about ecosystem, what is a bigger success story is not that there was one app which led to a consortium or a network. It's the collaboration and the ecosystem we have been able to build with all the researchers here. And I really wanted to thank Department of Medicine leadership uh, to actually have an Office of Technology Innovation and our medical informatics champions where people from all different divisions in medicine come together and meet monthly. When we started this a year ago, we only had two digital medicine projects going on. Right now we have a digital medicine project in some shape or form in nearly all of these divisions. And it is very empowering when we meet to see how the whole landscape has changed within a year. And this has allowed us to go to create more than a single app. We have right now 22 active projects going on with 20 funded projects. And these range from hepatitis C, DVT, HIV care with New York State, sickle cell uh, uh, population-based care, uh, neurology, psychiatry for mindfulness. So, and, and this is very empowering for me looking back to say, how we have been able to provide an innovation at Sinai, uh, an innovation team, which can actually serve the needs for all the researchers and clinicians in different specialties. And a lot of it is also possible because of our pillars. Um, Bruce Darrow, our CMIO is here, and I think a lot of the support we have got is from the IT, uh, which has allowed us to connect these app platforms with the electronic health records. Uh, there's a lot of support we have got from Mount Sinai Innovation Partners, which has allowed the uh, IP protection, intellectual property protection for many of these apps. Uh, Department of Medicine leadership uh, and the Mount Sinai Institute of Technology. So all these pillars which we had created have has, uh, helped us serve as a foundation to do these things. And to be honest, before I came to Sinai, we, I had never created an app before, right? We just had an idea on a web-based platform. And if we look at the timeline, in 2010 was when the iPad came, right? So this all technologies have been so fast and we are learning very fast 
Have we been able to deliver very fast? And we have this ecosystem, and part of this ecosystem is also what we call as the living lab of Sana Health System, which includes providers, whether they are within uh, the Department of Medicine or outside. These are part of the six hospital chain. The patients in different specialties, the population health executive who guide us how to actually uh, create value for value-based healthcare, and the researchers who really come up with fascinating ideas. And many times when they come up with the idea for their grants, we said, oh my god, we can't do this. But then we start thinking about it, and over two, three weeks, four, five weeks, we're able to at least narrow down some of the innovative things, which we, in our innovation team, did not even think of in the first place. And this overall collaboration is part of Mount Sinai Health System strategy. Um, so few of us got together and, and created a, a five-year strategy for digital medicine. Uh, and this was led by uh, Dr. Bruce Terra, our CMIO, along with representation from genomics, uh, from the emergency room, Nick Jeans. Um, um, and, and we had created where Mount Sinai stands and where we need to go in the next five years. And one of the concepts which we proposed to executive leadership was all these different aspects of digital medicine. The telemedicine, the, the apps, the analytics come together as a digital daisy, what we call it, to create a unique digital experience, not only for our patients, but also for our physicians, right? And we did uh, assessment of where we are compared to other health systems in the country. Um, and we need to move from level one and level two adoption to actually level five adoption, where we actually not only make these tools pervasive, so there's no patient and no speciality gets left behind in adoption. But we want to become leaders in this space in the US. And a lot of that includes not just making innovation or new technologies within Sinai, but actually partnering outside Sinai with major leaders in outside and bringing those technologies inside. Whether that technology is Apple HealthKit, which our genomics people uh, collaborated with to create this asthma research app, um, or the Circle of Health, which you got notification yesterday in broadcast, which was built in Spain, but now uh, through Dr. Fuster is being uh, provided here in English version. Or Lavango, which is completely a third party app, but we plan to bring it for population health needs from Mount Sinai Health System. And a lot of the stuff which we do in apps actually is really possible because we want to learn which patients are really, uh, the apps are the right medium to engage and which are not the right medium. And to make that happen, to learn from those app as an engagement tool, we have to do analytics. 2015 is often called the year of uh, what we call as movables, where all these blood pressure machines which are tied with Bluetooth and the weighing machines with Bluetooth can provide the data back to us. Movables to wearables like Garmin and Fitbit to implantables to actually now digestibles. So the FDA for the first time has approved Proteus uh, uh, a, a silicon chip which can go into medication and when patients swallow it, you can actually have a real-time adherence. So this is not Starbar age, this is actually FDA approved and we are planning to bring it into our ecosystem. So these all aspects of uh, Internet of Things, what we call, provide so much data that none of us can actually understand all this data and bring and really use it for the right patient. And that's where analytics allows us to filter all this data to provide the most actionable data summary to us at the right time for the right patient so we can make the right decision. And a lot of uh, uh, companies have started using this uh, Fitbit devices to actually create uh, uh, kind of gamification uh, within their ecosystem. And Humana 100 Day Dash is very popular, which led to 11.5 billion steps being taken in 100 days. Very soon you will see endeavors like that within our Mount Sinai Health System where I'll be competing against my bosses to see who is able to run more. Uh, Fitbit actually uh, had a dual recognition of being the most successful IPO in the space in 2015, but also being the most downloaded app during the holidays uh, because people were trying to get rid of the belly, all the stuff they have eaten. Uh, so these things are becoming mainstream. But we as physicians really need to leverage all this data that's coming out, not only for quantified self, which is personal, but map it for a population to create a new ecosystem we call as a quantified population health. Think of if two years from now, if we have completely quantified our diabetic population, our heart failure population, our IBD population, our chronic kidney disease population, that we have someone who is looking at all those patients in our health systems 
and seeing where they are and where they are heading, who is falling through the cracks and who is successful, and reach out to them through telemedicine or through face-to-face -face visits, wherever they are, we can provide a transformation level of care that has never been possible before. And it is this convergence of clinical recent patient-generated data is where we as a health system can create maximum value and potentially can lead to awesome outcomes. We have started baby steps in this direction and you can also use all this data for research and creating a unique research fingerprinting of each and every patient. So we are combining data from EPIC to data which is prospectively collected through a grant endeavor for a registry for our Crohn's and colitis with real time data collected from Health Promise app uh, and other research databases to create a unique research fingerprinting of each one of our IBD patients. But we have to, our job is not complete till we actually demonstrate improvement in outcomes. And for rightful reasons, there has been a major criticism that this is too much innovation, but we don't have enough learning from that, and we have not really changed outcomes. So the World Bank came with this report about 500 pilots they did in digital medicine space, um, and this was across developed and developing countries, and they found almost nothing about the likely uptake, the strategies for engagement, efficacy, or effectiveness of these digital medicine initiatives. Data has started to trickle in, and there's more and more evidence that telemedicine, two-thirds of the patients with telemedicine, or three-fourths, actually lead to a real-time change in the diagnosis or treatment arm. And 60% of patients whom you make a telemedicine visit actually may not need a face-to-face -face visits. And one of our own, Dr. Ida Vega, is running telemedicine in, in our primary care clinics. And, and just because of that learning pilot, we have been able to learn so much how we can make it completely into our ecosystem as the New York State law is finally passed. This is a very interesting study that got published in JAMA. And this is, you can see the scope. None of these studies were going into mainstream journals. There's not much high quality work that was being done to evaluate digital medicine. Now things like this are getting into mainstream journals. This is a study done by Australian researchers on a very simple text messaging tool. It was a semi-personal tool which used to give some reminders, some motivational messages uh, to patients with coronary heart disease. And over six months in a randomized controlled trial, they showed improvement, all significant, not only in LDL, which was primary outcome, but also in weight reduction, BMI, and 49% risk reduction in smoking, right? Such a powerful, just a simple text messaging protocol. And WellDoc, first WellDoc is the company which came with the Blue Star app. This was the first app which got FDA approval. And the reason it got FDA approval was because of the randomized control trial it did which actually showed people using WellDoc had a reduction of HbA1c by 1.2% than the control population. And 1.2% is similar to many changes, equivalent to the change which you can expect from many of the diabetic medication. So you can actually take these protocols, package them into an app, and in some cases, if you do it the right way, you can actually get the same level of outcomes improvement as you will get from pharmaceuticals. Right? This is the first time we in mankind actually have something else, or we as physicians have something else than medication or surgery to actually improve patient outcomes. We're calling it digital therapeutics. And now there are randomized controlled trials going beyond their meta-analysis and systematic reviews, which are showing from RCTs that more than half of these interventions can actually lead to improvement in patient adherence and 40% of these can actually lead to improvement in patient outcomes. So the evidence has started to build, but we do believe there's much more need to happen in this space. Um, and we believe this could be a, a, a great brand identity which Sina can create uh, using its academic uh, force to create a registry of digital medicine pilots, very much like clinicaltrials.gov, or to create a unique prescription universe where we can find the maximum evidence for the apps in each one of our specialty and provide a way where we can actually prescribe those apps very much like WellDoc app. So this is actually an app uh, which we have developed, which we plan to do beta testing over the next couple of months, and we'll be looking to your specialty to see if we can take the best evidence apps from your specialty. And by pressing the Rx button, you can just put the, um, the cell phone or the email of the patient, 
and the patient gets a link to download the app and get started with this app. So 2015 was the year of growth and year of variables. Can we have 2016 as the year of engagement and outcomes in digital medicine space? I will leave you with this thought and we welcome Jeff and Bhani to come on stage. What we really want to show is, as collaborators, we can work together to create some unique tools for your patient population and all of us can move together in this to actually create something which has never been possible before at Sinai. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ashish. Uh, good morning. So Pani and I are going to do a joint presentation and then hopefully have some time to do a live demo of uh, HepCure, uh, which is uh, the app we're going to be speaking about. Um, we call it a toolkit. Uh, that was developed to train a new cohort of hepatitis C providers and increase patient engagement for hepatitis C care. Uh, and we really appreciate um, the opportunity to work collaboratively with Ashish on this and several other collaborators from our group are in the audience, uh, Trang Vu, Corinne Perella, and Jason Rogers, who are key to the team's success. Disclosure uh, for myself. So, it's been acknowledged uh, in the literature and anyone working in hepatitis C is aware that more providers need to be trained uh, to do hepatitis C treatment uh, due to the revolution really in treatment that's going on in hepatitis C care, increased testing, and the need to treat patients where they're at, uh, which can often mean in methadone uh, maintenance programs and really outside uh, traditional settings perhaps for hepatitis C care for certain. Uh, so this was one of the key elements we had in mind in developing the HEPCURE toolkit. Project ECHO, uh, which probably many of you have heard of, it's gotten a lot of attention in telemedicine and certainly in hepatitis C care. Uh, this is a project that was developed in New Mexico, uh, which is a rather unique state that has one academic medical center in the middle of the state surrounded by rural communities. And Project ECHO um, was very successful in demonstrating that a teleconsulting model, so what you see here are the experts at the University of New Mexico, uh, which uh, includes liver specialists, psychiatry, uh, pharmacy specialists, consulting with um, many different uh, rural specialists you see on the screen, and discussing individual cases so that each uh, rural specialist uh, can learn from uh, the experts and from each case. And what Project EPCO was able to demonstrate were the same success rates of curing hepatitis C, sustained virologic response, in the rural communities as compared to University of New Mexico. And that was in the era of interferon treatment, um, so very impressive results. Uh, Pani and I actually went out to New Mexico, learned from what Project ECHO was doing, and then set out to develop something that we thought would um, go beyond uh, be specific, um, at least initially, to New York State, and act also uh, actively involve patients in the process. So HEPCURE is a partnership not only of Mount Sinai, but also our close collaboration at the New York State Department of Health, uh, AIDS Institute, uh, that has for uh, many years now funded primary care-based hepatitis C treatment in New York, um, and that had a pilot project, telemedicine project, to expand hepatitis C capacity at FQHCs in New York, and that brought in the third partner on this, which was Chicanies. Uh, we were fortunate to receive funding from New York State Health Foundation with supplemental funding from uh, the pharmaceutical industry. The goal was to create a state-of-the-art, innovative web application that would improve access to health care for individuals with Hep C, support providers, and lead to cost savings. Uh, there are three key components to the HepCure toolkit. And uh, what we think is somewhat unique is that they ideally can all be used in an integrated fashion, as we'll demonstrate, but they can all uh, as well be used individually, separately. So there is a dashboard for providers to guide them and provide uh, expert support in doing hepatitis C treatment. There's a mobile app for patients, and there's a webinar series uh, that occurs every Tuesday afternoon that providers attend at times patients attend, uh, that links into the provider dashboard. All that information can be found at the main project website, uh, hepcure.org. 
So in terms of engaging patients, we acknowledge that patients are primary stakeholders. We wanted HEPCURE to be patient-centered, uh, did development focus groups with patients to really get their input, very much wanting to expand the workforce to primary care providers, to other providers who maybe traditionally have not done hepatitis C treatment and now want to take this on, and to improve outcomes, and that is some of the work uh, that uh, Pani will be describing that we're undertaking to demonstrate uh, the impact of this uh, toolkit. So I'm gonna quickly go through um, uh, by slides in terms of the features of what, what we have integrated into the provider dashboard and then um, the patient mobile app and then hopefully we'll have a couple minutes to do a quick demo of, of one or, or hopefully both. So in terms of the HEPCARE dashboard for providers, um, the, the, the tools that it enables a provider to do is organize and track their panel of Hep C patients. So we went, when we went out to a lot of these community health centers and federally qualified health centers in New York State to find out how they were managing their patients from a primary care based standpoint with um, chronic Hep C, we found that a number of the providers were using a variety of different tools that they kind of had assembled, some were Excel spreadsheets, some were SharePoint um, files. So we really tried to work with providers to find out what they were actually already doing in practice and integrate those features into this dashboard. So creating a system in which they could organize and track their panel of patients in a HIPAA adherent fashion. Um, create and integrate treatment decision support algorithms to help determine the best options based on the combined ASLD IDSA treatment guidances. So we know that treatment for hep C has really just um, really leapt, uh, you know, taken big strides forward in the last several years. And so it's, it's tough oftentimes for a lot of providers to keep up with what's the latest treatment. So integrating those decision support algorithms was quite important to us. We've also integrated population health management uh, metrics. Uh, so we use the CMS quality indicators for hep C, so you can see how you as an individual provider are doing with respect to these quality metrics compared to um, other providers at your facility or across um, providers using the dashboard. We also, um, we also have the capability to link patients who are using the mobile app to the physician dashboard so that certain features that I'll, I'll mention about the, the, the patient app can then be integrated or pulled into the provider dashboard. Um, we can have the ability to release labs from the provider standpoint to patients, similar to what Epic does with their, the MyChart feature, and track treatment progress. And we've also integrated a teleeducation component where providers can actually um, submit cases that get stripped of identifiers so that they can be discussed at our upcoming weekly webinar series. Um, we do hold these webinar series um, every Tuesdays, 4.30 to 5.30, um, and it's usually split between a, a topic of interest related to hepatitis C and then discussion of cases. Um, and then there are additional provider and patient resources um, to, to help, help a provider take better care of their patients with hep C. So to date, um, we actually have four sites, including three federally qualified health centers that have already um, signed into using um, our hep care dashboard. Um, so going from the dashboard to the patient mobile app, um, you know, what we wanted to build for patients was quite different than um, what we wanted to build for providers. So we wanted, um, again, to have that option for patients who are seeing a provider who's using the dashboard to be able to link with that provider and send some um, key pieces of information um, to them around uh, treatment adherence and symptoms. And a provider can then view those, that patient um, information. Provider, as I mentioned, can release lab data and a, a patient themselves can find out what treatment options are available. And I think when we talk about patient engagement, that's a really powerful tool, as, as Ashish mentioned earlier. Um, and then we've also built in tools to assess patient treatment readiness. So knowing when the best time to start a patient on treatment is, is a very important part. And accessing resources around uh, what treatments are available or how to get optimized for treatment. Um, so I, um, I think we're going to show the, the, the patient mobile app first, but again, a patient can set medication reminders in the app. Um, they can enter appointments um, that sync up with their native calendar in their Android or um, I, iPhone um, or iTunes-based uh, mobile technology. They can track um, self-reported adherence and self-reported symptoms. They can actually enter their own labs if they wanted to. And again, they can view those labs that are released by providers. So I think in the four, first four to six weeks after we launched this at the end of last year, we had um, over 200 downloads of the app. Um, and it's, as I mentioned, already available in the Google Play and um, Apple iTunes App Store. 
Um, we've also integrated this into a larger project that's a um, CMS-funded uh, initiative that's led by the New York City Department of Health, of which we're one of two clinical sites. This is part of a, a three-year endeavor um, that's really um, trying to develop a, a care coordination model uh, to show that we can get more patients um, engaged in care, treated, and cured. And part of this has integrated um, the HEPCARE app at our site. So this is, again, those webinars um, that we talked about um, briefly. So to date, since February of last year, we've uh, conducted 40 webinars. We've actually had 733 live attendees. Um, we're working on getting the number of unique attendees. Um, all webinars get archived in case providers want to look at them or, or watch them later. And we're actually in, in the process of doing a provider self-efficacy evaluation um, with pre and post surveys um, to find out how much we can help move the needle in terms of provider knowledge and, and comfort with treating hepatitis C. We've also um, now uh, partnered with uh, a startup company called AdhereTech, which has developed these really neat um, smart pill bottles that have chimes and whistles and a lot of other neat features to really track um, and improve adherence. And what we've designed, um, and we're going to be starting very shortly, um, the, the bottles are being shipped to us as we speak, is, is really a clinical trial where we look at um, integrating this technology into our, our provider dashboard. Um, a, a kind of, it's going to be a three-arm trial. Arm one is going to just be kind of standard of care, passive monitoring of adherence um, to about 30-some 30, 30 patients. Arm two and three are, is going to involve a randomization of patients with hep C to um, work with providers who are using the dashboard to either just have features related to um, their patient app um, without the chimes and whistles of the bottle versus actually getting kind of the full-blown AdhereTech bottle along with the HEPCARE app to kind of really tease out what's the impact of the dashboard and what's the impact of the dashboard plus this um, additional adherence technology. So our, our primary outcome here is medication adherence with hep C-based treatments. A secondary outcome is going to be to look at um, cures or sustained virological response. So I think from here, we just have a, a few minutes, but I think we wanted to shift over to the um, mobile app. And I think while well, Jeff's getting that set up, I will, yeah, that's what I'll do. I can quickly show you what the physician dashboard um, looks like. And all of these are dummy patients. so. There's no sensitive information that you're going to look at. But as a new provider, you'd go through a, a very quick registration process. Um, and what you see here is um, this takes me into my dashboard view. So you can kind of see on the left side here, I have a navigation bar. This is a, a view where I'm able to kind of sort all of my patients. Maybe a new treatment regimen comes out for a specific genotype. I can see what patients have not yet been treated in my queue or my, my cohort of patients um, and easily look at those patients and say, you know, these are patients I want to kind of reach out to to discuss new treatments. Um, you're able to also submit cases, which I can show you. You can sort based on where a person, a patient is with respect to um, the, the treatment paradigm. Are they in a pretreatment phase, an on-treatment phase? Have medications been ordered and I need to check in with them to see um, whether or not, uh, you know, what's going on with the insurance approval? And um, what it allows you to do for a select patient, I'm going to find the one that I'm linked to with Jeff. So there's some that have a little link sign. So again, some of my patients might have the ability and interest to download the patient app. So in that scenario, I can actually sync up with the, uh, a specific patient. So here you see in terms of the other features of the dashboard, <clears throat> anything here with the green beaker means it's kind of a critical piece of information based on the decision support algorithms that I, I, ASLD and IDSA treatment guidances have created. So we need to know the genotype, we need to know the treatment history, we need to know whether or not the patient's interferon eligible and whether or not they have cirrhosis. When a physician selects those, um, those uh, key pieces of information, um, it then can give us an output. And I'm actually, for the sake of doing this, I'm going to go to one of my other test patients just quickly show this. So this patient's treatment naive, 1A, no cirrhosis. So what I can do is, um, in terms of pretreatment, I can, based on the IDSA ASLD guidelines, give a provider the treatment guidances that are in those guidelines to help try to guide the provider to say, these are the treatment recommendations that are actually recommended based on those guidances but it still allows a provider to select what individual treatment that they want to choose for a patient. 
It also allows us to enter um, baseline labs, and based on that baseline labs, we can do a fibrosis assessment, which is um, quite key in terms of you know, where we want to treat a patient in a primary care setting versus a, a specialty setting. So it calculates what we call a MELD score, a FIB4, and an OPRI score, which help us. Um, and then in terms of um, being able to really look at population health metrics, I'll quickly show you. Um, so certainly vaccination or immunization, um, immunity status to hepatitis A and B are, are critical things we look at in terms of hep C treatment. I can compare how I'm doing with my patients in yellow to those patients entered um, across other providers in my facility and any patient entered into this dashboard and get that population metric um, dashboard view. And then as I mentioned, for an individual patient, you can submit a case here, and the case then gets stripped of the identifiers, and you can discuss it actually in an upcoming um, webinar. We also have a place for provider and patient resources. A number of patients come to the providers looking for resources. So um, we're able to, for example, um, where, where's the other provider guidance? So we have all the package inserts, for example, for all the Hep approved medications. And then all of the webinars um, can be archived here for patients and provider, or providers to look at later. So that's a quick overview of the provider dashboard. And I think what we're going to now do is show you a very brief overview of the patient mobile app. OK, so the patient app um, would ideally be uh, used prior to the patient going on treatment. Uh, so I've um, already downloaded the app, and I'm actually um, on treatment in this. But just to uh, take you through it, it's very easy to set up. It does require an email account. Uh, that's a required a feature, because the patient has to confirm that. Uh, but then once the patient logs in, uh, there's a very discrete, limited set of uh, variables that we need. Date of birth is used for the provider who's linking to the patient uh, to confirm uh, that it is the correct patient. And what, um, if I was sitting uh, with Punny in her office, uh, she would actually generate a link um, through the dashboard and give that to me, either send it to me by email or give that to me to type in. And that's how we actually um, we're connected. So um, I'm connected now on the dashboard uh, to Punny as my provider. Uh, she's listed as m one of my team members. I can enter additional information to keep track of in terms of the pharmacy and insurance information. Uh, but to cut to some of the key features you know, that we really think are going to engage patients who are on treatment, um, certainly uh, feedback we've gotten from patients directly is that being able to not only have adherence reminders and track their adherence, but to know that that information is going to their provider is very valuable. Um, and it's not that they're expecting the provider you know, outside the visits to contact them, but having the sense that that information is being conveyed, that symptom information is being conveyed, it makes them feel very engaged and, and connected. Um, so here, um, I've been on treatment about eight weeks, and you see that it looks pretty good. I uh, have an 80% overall adherence level, uh, but if you go through on a weekly basis, you can get a more detailed sense. Uh, I'm on two pills. Each is uh, taken once a day, um, and it looks like I started out very well. Um, again, my provider is getting this information in real time, being able to see, you know, very satisfied week two, everything going well. Uh, but then once you get into week three, um, this particular patient has actually stopped taking one of the two medications. Um, so, you know, perhaps a side effect issue, the patient attributed to the medication and it was stopped. Um, so, you know, that allowed the provider to intervene in a timely fashion, um, get this patient back on track. So, you know, that um, is how this can be customized. There's an option for patients to actually uh, download pictures you know, for the medications and personalize it in whatever way they choose. For symptoms, um, that can be entered. I, you know, while Ashish was giving his lecture, I entered some symptoms, kind of having a rough morning, and that information, you know, would go directly into Pani's dashboard. She could see how I'm doing. And what's nice about that is it actually allows the patient to track, you know, in a chart, each individual symptom. So, you know, let's say the patient and or provider wanted to see, well, how is fatigue going during the course of treatment? They get a sense. And this can be entered 
you know, 30 times a day or once a week. It's really up to the patient how much information they want to enter. Um, same thing with lab information, you know, the provider can choose what labs to release to the patients, but when it comes to hepatitis C treatment, you know, patients are absolutely overjoyed to get the undetectable viral load result early on in treatment. It can be very motivating and very engaging for patients. Um, so I think I should probably leave some time for questions. Um, so I'm going to stop there in terms of the demo of the patient app. existing medical record systems like FA, eClinical Works, because I think the last thing that we as providers need is yet another set of data to integrate. Yeah, so I think, oh, Ashish, if you want to come up. Yeah, so I think definitely that represents um, a significant barrier at this point. Um, our next step is actually is working with um, Epic here. And also kind of we've already done an assessment of kind of the top EMR systems that a lot of the community health centers where hep C treatment is being done from a primary care standpoint to see um, if we could leverage funding to really make a deeper integration of, um, of this technology into the EMR systems. Because as you said, it, it does represent an additional barrier for providers to use this technology. Interestingly, we've had a lot of interest from international um, potential partners um, where they don't even have EMR systems. Um, where this could then serve as, as um, an EMR for a specific chronic disease in some of these, some, some of these conditions. That was actually something that was surprising to us, but um, we've had a lot of interest in that standpoint. I think that's a very relevant point. And the way technology is evolving, this mobile technology has come up much more faster than the integration technology with electronic health record. So EPIC uh, now has approved there's an emerging standard called FIRE, uh, FHIR, um, and EPIC has is we're working very closely with Epic that we allow real-time exchange of the data from the front end, but Epic is only gonna really make it happen in 2016 version. So our goal is whatever we can do within the constraint of technology we do it, uh, but eClinical works and many other EHRs actually are opening fire from India. So as soon as the technology becomes mainstream, FHIR, the, the same, we don't have to change anything within our app. We just provide this interface of FHIR and we will actually have a stream of uh, exchanging data real time. Uh, so I would say by 2016, 20, I would say 2017, when we implement Epic version, you will actually see most of the apps coming through a window within Epic or in other EHRs. Yeah, hi. Um, what, uh, what is some of your anecdotal experience and also the, the data, if there is much, on uh, this type of technology with patients? Uh, with lower health literacy, because that's always an issue that comes up in some populations. I, I can start from the experience we had uh, uh, when we did a web pod uh, at Cleveland Clinic. Uh, so I think uh, we were able to test the quality of life and get it implemented in 1,500 patients of all literacy levels uh, of SIBDQ. Uh, and we published that report, uh, so I can share that. What we found was, if you keep it very simple, uh, we actually, for all of these apps, we actually had them focus groups of patients at varying literacy level. Um, and there's a study that many people in homeless population has a lot of smartphone access. So for example, in Connecticut, 67% of homeless population has smartphone, partly through the Freedom Plan from Obamacare. So I think it's not technology use, it's the language, the medical language. And if we can make it fifth grade level or something less and validate in focus groups, we have actually found no decrease in completion rate of surveys and quality of life. Um, but again, it's very app dependent, so I think a regular process should be followed. I, I was very impressed with the outcome data, uh, and I've seen the Hep C uh, demonstrated before, and I think it's a fantastic uh, tool. I'm, I was wondering what the decay is in the impact, meaning how long have the longest studies been done, and do, do the reminders have less impact over time? Right. So I think we have started have cure recently. Yeah. 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 Right. yeah, I think that's a great question, and I'm not sure we know the answer at this point. Um, I think that would be something very interesting, actually, to look at. 
Um, we certainly, what we're trying to do is do an assessment, certainly on the provider standpoint, in terms of, again, how much we can increase uh, providers' comfort with doing treatment, um, knowledge around um, managing hep C. But I think to speak a little bit more to your question around, from the patient standpoint in particular, you know, maybe do, do you need reminders more up front and then you kind of, you get the hang of things. And, and I'm not sure, Jeff, I know your area of expertise is in adherence. I don't know if we have any yeah. other. I, mean, I think, you know, our advantage is most of the treatment now is eight or 12 weeks. So uh, fortunately, um, in our model, it's a time limited treatment, but applying it to more chronic disease management, um, you know, I think the broader adherence literature shows that, you know, any adherence decreases over time, and certainly that's a huge issue in chronic disease management. So how to incorporate features into these types of apps that, you know, address uh, or, you know, notice gaps in adherence and then intervene is probably the, the most important uh, frontier so that there's truly an interactive, customized, tailored, you know, intervention uh, addressing whatever the adherence barrier is. That's very true. So most of the literature so far has done, including uh, from Center for Connected Health at Harvard, has been on six months to one year. Um, and they have found decent, including our Health Promise app so far, we have uh, around seven months data. Um, and patients are engaged in a manner we want. Um, but I think part of having a, a, a development team within us at SANA is we can learn from it and modify it. Uh, we have not done gamification so far. Um, and we felt it would be too distracting for our chronic disease population to actually put the gamification right now. But I think as people start getting healthier and more at a general fitness level, they may, we may have to include those concepts as well. How, how do you look at privacy and uh, security concerns for the patients and the providers? So I think part of it is from the IT infrastructure standpoint. Uh, so everything that we have done in apps uh, is on a cloud-based system. It's all approved by uh, IT uh, at Mount Sinai, and we have worked through the privacy policy in terms of use with our legal team at Sinai. So we have a framework of where we build all the apps, and one of the reasons we did was for the fact that if, even if you lose the device, actually no data is stored on the device. So everything is protected firewall. We actually published some case studies on that as well. Um, and there's another part of governance which is beyond the technology, which is the good terms of use from the physicians, uh, the auto log off options, and physicians not using it in a very open manner, like anyone can see it, and also for patients. So I think uh, those are covered, like the best practices of using this are covered in the terms of use of the app, which patients have to sign off uh, before they use the app. So I think part of having a uh, ecosystem uh, 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 at Mount Sinai is there is already a precedence for a few of the apps, uh, including the electronic signature, which uh, our IRB approved for the asthma app. So someone who has walked the path before actually helps us that we can use the same validated uh, processes and technology for the apps. One last question. Yeah, we, we have multiple chronic diseases. Uh, do you plan to, s and therefore we have four or five conceivable apps addressing each of those diseases. Do you have plans to study the efficacy of those and the advantages and disadvantages? Uh, comparing different chronic diseases? Or? No, you have patients who have four chronic diseases and you have four mm -hmm. apps. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, how do you plan to So I think, um, and whenever I have a very tough question, I actually defer that question to Bruce Darrow. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I will give him a chance to do that. Uh, all our apps are on a singular platform. So actually we can merge and invoke one app with another app we need to. What we have not done is we wanted to first learn from a little more simplistic scenario that we can understand we have improved outcomes in that. As we walk that path, I think we will actually enable. So for example, now we are merging three of our apps together, the telemedicine, secure messaging, and heart disease management. So I think we will be able to, at some stage, have a module uh, where we will be able to integrate many of those quality of life and symptom questionnaire for chronic disease together. We're not there as of now, um, but maybe uh, Dr. Darrow has better insight uh, on this, how we, we have to address this at some stage. Uh, we wanted to walk the cleaner path before we go with that. Thank you very much. I want to commend Ashish, Puni, and Jeff uh, for their initiative. It's been wonderful to see these projects uh, and initiatives evolve, and we'll be looking forward to seeing where we are this time next year. So well done. This is really fantastic. Thank you.